Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we begin our sub theme of philosophy in the Philosophy Hour. And perhaps appropriately, given that this is our introductory lecture in the Philosophy Hour, we should begin with the first philosopher in the Western tradition, Plato. This lecture will be an introductory overview of some of the basic themes that we should be aware of when reading Plato in order to make Plato a richer and more lively read. So as most people probably are aware of, philosophy means love of wisdom. Essential to understanding Plato is why it is important for man to strive, to seek, to move to wisdom and how it relates to life on earth. Most people think that Plato advocated for some kind of world flight. This is deeply misleading. Plato, while a theorist of the transcendental forms, nevertheless has pragmatic functionality to life on earth. Everyone knows or is familiar that Plato established the first system of philosophy. But the system of philosophy which Plato established does not necessarily have answers, as it does leave questions open-ended for us. The Republic, for instance, is all about seeking wisdom and living the good life. But the Republic is an incomplete work. The dialogue ends incomplete. Air is returning to the world, from what he has seen and been told by the gods, but we, as readers, are left in the dark. Air returns to his body, but he doesn't know how. Why ethics are related to philosophy in Plato and the classics more generally is because embodying nature involves action itself. First and foremost, Plato is a political philosopher concerned with right living and right living is what we call ethics. The self and nature itself is an act of engagement, of doing, of living in the world. One cannot embody goodness without action. One cannot embody justice without action. One cannot embody knowledge without action. One cannot embody nature without action because human nature, according to Plato, is fundamentally about engagement and participation in the world and with others. That is, Plato's philosophy of nature is a participatory nature of becoming and doing. To understand the forms requires action in the world, hence why air is revived and given a mission of action back in the mortal world. It is not good enough for air to simply have beheld the good, but to embody that wisdom requires involvement in life. Ethics is the manifestation, the practical manifestation of knowledge, which leads to virtue, which is always about engagement with the world and with others. So what drives ethics? What drives ethics is love. This is why philosophy entails a love of or for wisdom, philia and sophia. It is attempting to befriend, it is the art of philosophy, is the attempt to befriend wisdom and cultivate a friendship with wisdom. Hence why friendship with Socrates in most of the Platonic dialogues is the instantiated concrete form of philosophical wisdom. This love for wisdom and cultivating a friendship with wisdom has ramifications for life on earth, and that ramification for life on earth is what Aristotle eventually called phronesis, or excellence, a practical or vocational wisdom and excellence in life. The meaningful life is, in fact, the ethical life. The ethical life entails engagement with others, with friends, 
much as philosophy has a relational and participatory ethos to it. When you think about Plato's dialogues, you see this right away. They are conversations with friends, friendship with Socrates, participata participation in the dialectic are all essential to the Platonic dialogues. Since, since man is a social animal, the highest wisdom cultivated in life entails friendship with other men to live that fulfilled life of duties and relationships with others. The philosophical pursuit that leads to life of disengagement or even reducing philosophical pursuits to merely intellectual ends is a betrayal of true philosophy. Plutarch in particular, who was also a Platonist, hammers the Stoics and the Peripatetics precisely for this reason. Their philosophical pursuit leads to a life of intellectual disengagement, while the true philosophy, the Platonic philosophy, leads to a life of engagement in the world. This is why, on another note, all of Plato's written works are dialogues, dialogues of engagement. As we've said, Socrates, who is the principal character in most of Plato's dialogues, is the philosophy embodying is the philosopher embodying the true nature of nature itself. He is a seeker of wisdom and engager with the world. There is not a moment in the dialogues where Socrates is off alone. He is always in the thick of it. He even forms friendships with his opponents in some of the dialogues, recognizing the wisdom in friendship, even if the ideas promoted by the certain sophists are incorrect, such as when Socrates befriends Thrasymachus in the Republic. Philosophy then, as a movement of love, has ethical consequences to life. This is another reason why ethics is such a major concern for Plato and the philosophical tradition in general. The fulfilled life, the good life, is the ethical life. But what is good? What is ethical? That is the pursuit of philosophy. And this returns us to part of Plato's mission in the first place, to carve out a space for ethical, meaningful, fulfilled life, which the Ionian metaphysicians and sophists could not do or were not interested in doing until Plato's arrival. This movement to embodying wisdom and practical life, ethical right, leads to the birth of classical natural right philosophy. Right action in life, moved by wisdom leading to the unity of rights and duties to each other, is the goal of classical philosophy, especially in the post-Platonic tradition. For rights cannot be sustained without duties and obligations, and duties and obligations for the sake of duties and obligations eventually collapse unless they are tied to higher, more transcendental goods, like the forms. After all, air is revived and told to engage with the world of mortals after having glimpsed the vision of the good, true, and beautiful. It is not good enough to simply behold. One must also take that love of wisdom and engage in the world. Furthermore, that is precisely what Socrates does whenever he is the principal character of the Platonic Dialogues. The love of wisdom and for wisdom leads to engagement in the world, and this has a practicable application since our love of wisdom always results in engagement in this world rather than engagement in the next. Even where Socrates is not the main dialogue character, like in the laws, the leading philosopher of the dialogues is always engaging the world rather than standing apart from it. In later Aristotelian terminology, philosophy is purposive activity 
that entails encounter and engagement with the world and others, that they may begin purposive activity, which is, of course, the very nature of man. Humans are not static creatures. They are creatures of movement and engagement, of love and life. The love or pursuit of wisdom is itself an activity. The consummation of this wisdom now reflects back to earth as the human person embodies the wisdom of truth in their lives. This leads to a new living, a new activity, a higher living, a higher activity, by which man lives by on earth. The greatest deception or misleading claim about Plato and Platonism is that the ideas have no impact on how to live in this life and on this earth. On the contrary, the ideas are directly linked to how we should live as anyone who has read Plato truly knows. Thus, when we begin to read Plato, when you begin to read Plato, always keep in mind that Plato is not actually advocating world flight out of this world to the realm of the forms. He is actually advocating a coming to know the wisdom of the forms so that we have a practical new relationship of living in this world and in this life with others. Now we move to one of the great joys of Plato, his use of foreshadowing and prefiguring in his dialogues. Plato is probably the first author to systematically develop the literary notion of foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is contained in the very opening of his most famous work, The Republic. I want to explore and explain here Plato's foreshadowing and why it is such a clever tactic and one that, when recognized by the reader, enriches the reading of Plato and his works. I will, in this brief overview of foreshadowing and prefiguring, primarily focus on the Republic as it is his most well-known and widely read dialogue. The Republic is, of course, a most fascinating work, deep and rich, which I have a brief 8,000-word commentary article on, which I will provide a link for interested readers to review. But the beginning of the work sets the literary structure of foreshadowing perfectly in lines 327a through c. It begins with Socrates. I went down to Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, son of Ariston, to pray to the goddess, and at the same time, I wanted to observe how they would put on the festival, since they were now holding it for the first time. Now, in my opinion, the procession of the native inhabitants was fine, but the one the Thracians conducted was no less fitting a show. After we had prayed and looked on, we went off toward town. Ch catching sight of us from afar, as we were pressing homewards, Polymarchus, son of Cephalus, ordered his slave boy to run after us and order us to wait for him. The boy took hold of my cloak from behind and said, Polymarchus orders you to wait. And I turned around and asked him where his master was. He is coming up behind, he said. Just wait. Of course we'll wait, said Glaucon. A moment later, Polymarchus came along with Adimantus, Glaucon's brother, Nicaratus, son of Nicias, and some others, apparently from the procession. Polymarchus said, Socrates, I guess you two were hurrying to get away to town. That's not a bad guess, I replied. 
Well, he said, do you see how many of us there are? Of course. Well, then, he said, either prove stronger than these men or stay here. Isn't there still one other possibility? I said, our, pers our persuading you that you must let us go? Could you really persuade, he said, if we don't listen? Plato's ingenious opening and foreshadowing is something we should all recognize. In the opening lines, we see Socrates having went to a festival for the purpose of observation. Philosophy is about observation. When Polymarchus sends the slave boy to catch Socrates, the slave boy uses force. He tugs and holds on the cloak of Socrates to stop him. And he says, Polymarchus orders you to wait. When Polymarchus and his friends arrive, he says to Socrates, either prove stronger than these men or stay here. Polymarchus is saying, if Socrates wants to be free, he must wrestle and prove himself physically stronger than the men around him. But Socrates offers the alternative philosophical, uh, the alternative philosophical dialectic to brute force, that of persuasion. As he says, if we can persuade you to let us go, wouldn't you let us go? First, we see the social nature of man and the social responsibility or engagement of philosophy. This is exhibited in the fact that Socrates and Glaucon went to a festival together. While this particular festival is said to be the first time performance, festivals were a common public activity in the ancient world and remain so in more traditional parts of the world or among, say, your local Catholic parish which puts on a community festival every year. Festivals are public events, public gatherings. The participation in the festival, as well as the camaraderie of Socrates and Glaucon, foreshadows the question of man as a social creature, which is much discussed throughout the pages of the Republic. The second foreshadowing is when Polymarchus orders his slave boy to order Socrates and Glaucon to wait. Attached to this being forced to wait for Polymarchus is the declaration for Socrates to, again, prove stronger than these men or stay here. This is foreshadowing Thrasymachus, most obviously, but the general contestation and contest between Socrates and the other sophists, including Glaucon, as to what philosophy is, is foreshadowed in these statements. Here, the third and most critical foreshadowing appears, the very essence and art of Platonic philosophy. Isn't there still one other possibility? Socrates says, our persuading you that you must let us go, dialectically tied together in the contest between force or strength and persuasion or reason is the very essence of philosophy. We see force and persuasion tied together, but only one can win. Immediately we see who the arbiter of reason is and who the arbiters of force are, Socrates and the Sophists respectively. By tying the forced stalling and proving stronger with the other possibility of persuasion, Plato foreshadows much of the dynamism and dialectical tension that runs through the dialogue. The contest between the Sophists, who advocate in their own forms the employment of force to achieve individual ends, and Socrates, who advocates for understanding through reason and persuasion. Being aware of this makes one appreciate more deeply the greatness of Plato. The entire order and movement of the dialogue is set up from the very beginning. Moreover, recognizing this foreshadowing allows one to penetrate deeper and find deeper meaning in the text 
when rereading Plato or simply reading Plato for the first time. Without a preface, Plato uses the opening lines of the dialogue as a sort of preface. Plato informs the reader in the highlighted quotes that I have provided what the rest of the dialogue is about, the social nature of man, the very task of philosophy, the tension between force and persuasion, between brute strength and eloquent reason. This awareness of what Plato has set up is foreshadowing and prefiguring allows the attentive reader a new lens into the dialogues of Socrates and the other philosophers through the ten books of the Republic. One also sees how the dialogue plays upon these themes established to be discussed in greater detail as the work unfolds. One may also be able to better understand the dialectic between force and reason and how it is wielded in post Thrasymachus sophists like Adimantus and Glaucon in their discourses. One finds Plato's use of foreshadowing throughout all of his dialogues. In the Symposium, for example, his great dialogue on Eros and knowledge of Eros, Glaucon rushes to Apollodorus and says that he was looking for him line 172a, and to find out how the speeches on love went, in line 172b. In the opening paragraphs of the Symposium, Plato foreshadows what the whole of the Symposium is about, Eros as searching, like Glaucon searching for Apollodorus. So to know what love is, Glaucon's wanting to know how the speeches on love went. The rest of the dialogue provides the answers to what searching and love are, which were foreshadowed to us at the very beginning of the symposium. Another one of the best examples of hidden foreshadowing is in the dialogue the Timaeus. The dialogue opens with Socrates, restating his thoughts on the ideal city, a reference to the Republic, and with a short speech by Critias on the political which includes the famous story of Atlantis. Plato is telling us in these speeches, which begin the Timaeus, that Timaeus's speech is really about the political, even though superficially and at the exoteric level, the outward level, the speech seems to be about cosmology. And Timaeus reveals this at the end of his superb dialogue, at line 87b. However, the lengthy discourse on nature, telos, the cosmos, the demiurge, reason and necessity are all building to a political reality which Timaeus reveals at the end of the dialogue. Without a foundation for knowledge and nature, the very project of the political which all humans are engaged in will fail. Plato, in most of his dialogues, brilliantly foreshadows for us what the dialogues will discuss and what is to come. But we must have the eyes to see and the ears to hear to pick up on the master and his craft. Lastly, one of the other great themes we should be made aware of when reading Plato is his use of irony and satire. Plato was one of the great ironists of the ancient world, and in fact bequeathed to the rest of literary culture a deep notion of irony permeating throughout one's entire text. What is Platonic irony? Why does it enrich one's reading of Plato? Why should we be aware of his use of irony and satire? Admittedly, Platonic irony is more visible to realize if one has a knowledge of ancient Greek. However, even if you don't know ancient Greek, a careful and studious reading of good vernacular translations will also show the visible signs of the use of irony, or if one simply has, say, a broader knowledge of Greek 
culture and context. You will also see irony and satire when certain speakers are making references to certain thinkers or poets incorrectly. Irony is the use of language to convey the true meaning of what is being discussed. The target of ironic satire in Plato is generally, of course, the sophists. I will highlight a few examples of Platonic irony for us. Thrasymachus's name in Greek means fierce warrior or savage animal, and Thrasymachus is depicted as a fierce and savage animal in the Republic. When he is first introduced in the Republic, Thrasymachus is coiled up in a bush, ready to pounce like an ambushing predatory beast. In fact, when Thrasymachus enters the conversation, Plato through Socrates states that he hurled himself like a lion about to devour Socrates. Additionally, in the conversations between Socrates and Thrasymachus, Thrasymachus's use of language is equally warlike and savage. They are brutal. Socrates' speeches, however, are eloquent and rational. Again, there is a great irony in Thrasymachus in that his very name is reflected in how he acts in the dialogue. Another example of name irony in the Republic is Glaucon. Glaucon's name in Greek means gray-eyed, which is an allusion to an owl, more specifically and probably the owl of Athena. Owls are traditionally interpreted as wise animals. Anyone familiar with folklore will know this, or if you've seen certain uh, animated movies, the owl character is usually the wise sage in those movies. We see this again all throughout culture. However, throughout the dialogue, Glaucon's speeches are the antithesis of wisdom. Glaucon's wisdom is no wisdom at all. The true wise man is Socrates and not Glaucon. This now has a comedic effect given Glaucon's name and what it is meant to signify. Instead, Glaucon name, Glaucon's name signifies the opposite of its meaning, hence the irony attached to Glaucon's name implying wisdom, yet his discoursing with Socrates produces anything but wisdom for the reader and the audience. Plato's use of irony with names and depictions is to show that the sophists, despite their claims to wisdom, even if it is entailed in their very name, is unwise. Hence the irony of the sophists. They are the supposed wise men of Athens, yet they say nothing wise at all over the course of the dialogues. Sticking with the theme of comedy from irony, platonic irony also merges with the literary device of comic equivalence. This comes out most poetically in the symposium. Comic equivalence is displayed by Aristophanes, who was an enemy of Socrates and, by tutelage extension, an opponent of Plato. Aristophanes, of course, was a famous playwright, a dramatist. His elaboration on the birth of Eros, desiring love stemming from a lacking, in the world is dramatic and impassioned because love is dramatic and passionate, like Aristophanes' speech. However, Plato's satirization of Aristophanes also shows comic equivalence. Through comedic irony, truth is expressed in Aristophanes' speech, hence why it is ironic. Aristophanes' speech begins after he has recovered from hiccups and is overly dramatic and certainly not right in the particular. That is, that is, was Zeus's tearing asunder the human, which causes him to seek his lost half, his soulmate. That, of course, Plato is telling us isn't true. But there is truth to what Aristophanes is, in fact, saying about love being an attempt to find wholeness or completeness. For all the drama attached to Aristophanes' speech, it is Aristophanes, not the other philosophers prior to him, who stumbles upon a truth about love in the world 
and why love seeks unity and wholeness. In fact, when you read the speeches of the symposium carefully, you will realize that the poets are, are the ones who each provide a partial truth before Socrates' famous speech about diatoma. Aristophanes' absurd and comical speech reports the truth that Eros comes from a lacking, while Agathon's speech, another comic playwright, speaks the truth that Eros seeks the good and the beautiful. Though, as we know from Socrates, Agathon's speech doesn't actually include the good and the beautiful as Socrates' cross-examination exposes. Nonetheless, what Aristophanes and Agathon say, that love is a search for completeness and that love aims for the good and the beautiful, are true. That is the use of comic equivalence. All of the other scientists and philosophers who spoke before the poets do not speak any truth concerning the nature of love. This is an important thing to recognize when reading Plato, especially Plato's criticism of the poets in the Republic. Plato advocates throughout his corpus the proper imitation of the forms to form our nature in the process of becoming a manifested reflection of the forms on earth. Many of the philosophers of Plato's day were far from the truth as evidenced by the fact that all the philosophers, sans Socrates in the symposium, have an understanding or presentation of Eros which will lead to the dissipation or destruction of Eros. The philosophers know not what they speak of, something that is readily apparent in most of Plato's works. It is the poets, however, who glimpse truth, but not the whole truth. Because they lack the proper understanding, they do not get Eros right in some respects. Their inability to articulate in coherent and understandable and relatable manners something to imitate is the problem of the poets. There is a double irony in the contrast between the philosophers and the poets in that the poets are superior to the philosophers, the sophists, but are depicted, like in the symposium, in an absurd and foolish way. Plato was undoubtedly a master of irony, but Plato's irony also has a mean-spirited bent to it. Plato's satirization of his opponents, who convey truth out of their irony, truth via negation, as with the sophists in the Republic, or truth via comedy, as in the symposium, is done out of a certain malevolent intent on Plato's part. Aristophanes is depicted as crazy, but in his craziness, he stumbles upon truth like the equivalent of the mad scientist of today's ironic comedic trope. The sophists are depicted as crass, conceited, and unwise. The truth, however, that they speak about comes via negation, via negativa, truth as in not what they said. What is wisdom? What the sophists are not? What is comic equivalence? The insane Aristophanes who stumbled upon truth, though he doesn't know it, because he is caught up in the drama of myth. And that is the primary reason why Plato is against the poets. The poets speak of myth in the poetic and absurd sense. You should not imitate what the poets are saying, even if there is a kernel of truth in what the poets are suggesting. Being able to read the irony in Plato's dialogues makes Plato's works richer. It also exposes or opens new levels of intertextual interpretation and penetration, which makes the text richer for us as readers. So, gentle reader, the next time you read Plato, remember that Plato's importance of the forms have a practical application in this life. 
try to find the foreshadowing and the prefiguring that Plato uses because that is important to understand the essential dialogues in the, di the essential dialogues contained in his works. And also look for how Plato uses irony and satire to convey his points. Plato truly is a wonder and a joy to read once you begin to unlock the mysteries of the Platonic dialogues.